Uh, welcome everyone. If you haven't joined us for one of our Friday afternoon Barrazas or Carter lectures this fall 2021, um, we will go plus or minus 45 minutes with today's speaker that will, as I just said, for those of you that were in the room, leave us another 45 minutes for questions, answers, comments from the room. Uh, we will wrap up the session uh, at five o'clock. Uh, if our speaker today is so inclined and has time in his schedule, uh, at that point, we'll stop the recording. I will turn on video for everyone left in the room. And if Kudus wants to hang out and chat informally after the end of the of the formal session, uh, we'd love to have that happen. That would be an unmoderated uh, part of the program today. Uh, when we get to the Q&A today, uh, please use your raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, I will call on you in the order that I see hands. And I will also uh, switch you over to panelists, which means you can enable your video if you want to have a little bit better interaction with our speaker today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Director for Center for African Studies, Brenda Chalfin, for uh, a, a welcome, and then we will also have a more detailed inter inter introduction of today's speaker following that. So Brenda, go ahead. I'm going to stop sharing that screen. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our third lecture in the Carter 2021 series, which is organized by Joan Frosch, who is a professor in the School of Theater and Dance in the College of the Arts here at UF. The Carter Lecture Series addresses a broad range of topics around choreographer, choreography and dance in Africa at this moment. It's titled Back to the Future, Choreographers Mobilizing Africa Source Futures in the Post parentheses COVID era. Today, Kudus Onukeku, who is our colleague and visiting artist in the Center for Arts Migration and Entrepreneurship. It's so exciting to hear from him about what he's doing, whether here in Florida, around the world, and um, in Lagos, where he and his dance company, Afropolis, is based. I am not um, introducing Kudus, however, I will turn that over to Hajarat Ali, who can tell us more about um, his work, his background, and the talk today. Once again, welcome. Thank you very much, Brenda. Um, so, um, Kudus Onikeku is a movement artist made of diversity. Over the decade, he has established himself as one of the preeminent multi-talented artists working today with different media, performance, research, installation, curating, and community organizing. He is the artistic director of the Nigeria's preeminent creative organization, the People's Center Lagos, which operates as a creative incubator that applies artistic competence, human resources, innovation, and creativity as capacities for human-centered content development. Kudu's international artistic practice intersects between his interest in visceral body movement, kinesthetic memory, disruptive practices, and finding new vocabularies for performances that aren't centralizing Eurocentric approaches, embracing an artistic vision and a futurist practice that both respects and challenges Yoruba culture and contemporary dance. He has created a substantial body of critically acclaimed work that ranges from solos to group works, as well as artist to artist collaboration with visual artists or architects, musicians or writers, multimedia artists or technologists. Kudus Onikeku has participated in major exhibitions and festivals across 56 countries, including Venice Biennale, Bernal de Leon, Festival d'Avignon, Roma Europa, TED Global, Torino Danza, Kalamata Dance Festival, Dance Umbrella, Beat Dance Festival, and so on. His dance work is in the permanent collection of the National Gallery of Canada. He has been a visiting professor of dance at the University of California, Davis, and Columbia College, Chicago. Kudus is currently the first maker in residence at the Center for Arts, Migration, and Entrepreneurship of the University of Florida. His current research in developing interactions with cutting edge technologies that uses artificial intelligence and blockchain technology to create new economic opportunity for creators of value and in essence, lay a background for cutting edge interactive systems to synthesize, gamify, preserve, remotely teach, freely share, 
collaborate and revolutionize dance and movement in the digital age, building a bridge between technology and Afro diasporic community, as well as dance and IP. Um, so let's stop there. <laughs> Thank you. And Kudus, we welcome you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it um, um, was, uh, was such a fun to hear how to read my time. <laughs> OK. Um, wow. I can only, OK, let me see if this is going to be all right. So I hope I'm very clear. I can be heard very clearly. I will um, start my conversation today or my talk today, um, which I've prepared, and I'm going to. Um, <clears throat> I want to say a very big thank you, first and foremost, to the Africa Center, Brenda, uh, to John Trosh, um, who both of whom have been really, really kind to us uh, in, in Gainesville. And um, the relationship with built has, has been even before my coming to, to, to Gainesville and also uh, continue to grow stronger as, as we, we pass through our time here. And I want to say a very big thank you to um, uh, the Center for Arts, Migration and Entrepreneurship for their um, hosting. Uh, to have someone like me here for a three years residency is not an easy thing because even out of the three years, I don't know how much time they actually get to see me. Um, the presentation I'm going to make today is actually um, um, a kind of a, a resume of my research here um, at, the, at the Center for Arts, Migration, and Technology. So I'd like to start um, to introduce my presentation by, by asking a few questions to, to the listeners. Um, have you ever wondered um, who owns the viral dance moves? I'm not talking about the video shares. I'm talking about what is inside, you know, like when you upload someone else's music that doesn't belong to you on, in, on the internet, there is a way at which you, be, you know, signify that this is not yours. So why is there no motion recognition software? Like kind of a shazam for that move. Can we, uh, at this point, get artificial intelligence to help protect movement-based intellectual property? Can we take advantage of the arrival of Web3 to create a shared economy for dance and all the unpaid labels of dancers in the age of NFT? Since the explosion of, of Black Lives Matter movement last year, you know, uh, there have been a whole lot of conversation about race of justice and wealth redistribution. But uh, my own interest is actually saying, rather than talking about wealth redistribution, could we, at this current stage of our uh, technological advancement, talk about wealth redistribution, you know, before you get into anybody's bank account? Uh, the new frontiers of technology is currently disrupting dance as we know it. And I really wonder if uh, dance professionals around the world are paying enough attention. Uh, in the digital universe, it is even uh, is it even possible? You know, the question is even possible to determine who owns the dance moves before they get permanently minted on blockchain or sold on video games or commercialized on similar platform without any royalty mechanism or proper credit to the creators themselves. So, like I said, I'm currently uh, a maker in residence at the Center for Arts, Migration, and Entrepreneurship here at the University of Florida. And my current research is really at the intersection of technology and uh, just like Hadi has said, and uh, African and African diaspora communal practices, you know, especially as it, as it relates to the question of dance and intellectual property. I, with uh, a couple of scientists and technologists, are developing a decentralized software called uh, Akinda, which uh, is going to be a kind of um, you know, is exploring a deep tech solution. You know, deep tech solution actually means, deep tech means technology that is bringing one or two different technologies together to form a particular solution. 
uh, and then this point, yeah, bringing all of that together to solve this problem of, of appropriation for dancers who uh, to have a better control of their own creations and benefit from their motion data, especially when uploaded onto the digital marketplace. Uh, so in this presentation, I am going to examine the legal and the ethical implications of my research and its uh, development process. Um, so according to uh, copyright law, dance is copyrightable by law. You know, the law states that the body of work that is protected must be an original creation and, has, and that has been um, memorialized, you know, that is documented in a tangible form, which means, you know, either it's been notated or codified or whatever in a written form. So, however, uh, a dance move is not considered a creative body of work, God, not copyrightable. So, <laughs> here the vital point of my question is this. If a dance move is not considered a creative body of work, then who owns viral dancing? You see, I'm not talking about the, the I'm not talking about data rights. I'm not talking about the infringement that is already in, you know, in the uploaded data itself. You know, all the snippets of our dance creations that we or our dancers or our audience members put online. Who can lay claims on, on them if they happen to go viral or and therefore become valuable? Because without virality, those dances does not become really valuable in, 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 in digital spaces. So now the bias of the law lies in its poor understanding of dance in the age of virality. That is, the law interpreters use an approach that is now easily contested as archaic, non-inclusive, and racist, you know, from a certain viewpoint. Because the law that exists today favors mostly a Western approach to concert theater, choreographic tradition, which elevates the status of uh, the choreographer above the dancers. And it is so because the logic that says a dance move or this snippet of dances can be owned draws their understanding of dance from the basic movement of classical ballet, which aren't unlimited in possibilities and must therefore be kept available to be utilized as the choreographer's basic material. But I'm not here talking about the individual movement, you know, the, the hustle set, the, the plie, the pirouette, or the second position of classical ballet. I, I'm equally not referring to, you know, ordinary motor activity or gestures or commonplace movement or whatever dance set <laughs> that has no belonging, no, no, no proper identifiability. You know, we all can create a kind of uh, accurate or at least a relatively mind image if we say, you know, for Nigerians, if we say Chaku Chaku or Azonto or Guaraguara or even Salsa, Hausa, Capoeira, Moonwalk, Hatha, Yoga, Taichi, or even Flamenco. You see, I'm making a case for all these myriads of signature moves that enters into the category of what we call viral dance trends, whether it's in history or in contemporary time. But most importantly, I refer to a unit of key or symbolic movement that can be repeated in a loop and form the base of a variation of, of an existing dance style, you know, like viral emotionality and reading that can be further developed you know, through improvisation. So for the purpose of Asunda as a digital project, by dance moves, we mean connected dances that gather the information about their properties through either the camera or through sensors that you can have in motion capture suits and things like that, and share this data from a physical body within a given space with other bodies over the internet in space and time. So any dance move that is captured digitally and linked over public or private neural networks becomes part of the world of Asuna. And we are saying that such data should be traceable to its original owner, whether they're aware of it or not, or even say whether they are alive or not. <laughs> so far as there is an oral history, 
that can help us make the trace convincingly, we should be able to trace uh, this uh, work. You know, I take an example of moonwalk, for example. If we all agree that Michael Jackson was the inventor of moonwalk, I think generations from generations, which I, I know many people will disagree, but anyway, generation from generation from now, whether it is a thousand years later, they should be able to still trace it back to the original history of moonwalk. So again, why protect dance? Some people ask me often, often when I tell them when I talk to them about this project. Let's take Fortnite as a case study. So Fortnite, in case you don't know what it is, uh, is this ultra successful free-to-play battle royale game, which made over six billion dollars profit in revenue in its first two years. You know, partly, and I would. I would even argue that mostly for its use and sale of what they call emotes, which are basically uh, emotes are basically in-game animations of fire dance moves, you know, mostly created by independent black creators, and they do this without any compensation given to the creators and for their IP. There are several lawsuits against Fortnite, but Fortnite continues to win because of the ambiguity of the law. As the game has rules and what is that composition, what is copyrightable or not. So these so-called emotes, you know, in my opinion, are unethically diversing dances from the original context and uh, thereby erasing uh, the work of artists in the process. So Fortnite is just one among them. Now let's also take uh, Beyonce's Black is King as another example. You know, if you've seen that, 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 that production, you know, we look at that, we look at it and you see that all the cultural and the choreographic aesthetic, you know, that was used in that production, we can see how much uh, Beyonce is taken directly from contemporary creators on the continent. Um, who are, if you're following, who are currently exploding the limits of creativity on the internet. So, if, if it was easier to speak about Fortnite appropriation because they sell those dance moves for, for about $5 as in-game purchase, you know? So you can trace that, okay, you sell $5, you're going to give you back, you know, percentage or whatever, and you're talking about just one thing. But then, uh, what, are, what then are the, are the available mechanisms to be able to calculate how much Beyonce was to pay all these creators out of the $100 million deal with Disney? even if she feels compelled to do so. That is to say, currently, there's even no mechanism that we can use to, to the kind of um, smart contract that we use to already identify, you know, what should be a fair, you know, payment or a fair return for the people or the communities that we are really using their stuff uh, most of the time without any permission. So as we can see, uh, uh, yesterday's solutions are now to this problem. And uh, we realize that uh, new technology, as I've noticed, can bring great wealth, but oftentimes not share prosperity. This is a perpetuation of the pattern of appropriation, where return from creative output slips away from the hands of those with less. And you know, those who spark fire brilliance from nothing to those with so much more, absorbing whatever they can, you know, and erasing the past in the process. But let us be clear, you know, when I talk about uh, dance ownership, I'm not at all, at all, at all talking about uh, the capitalist logic of the big copyright, like, you know, copyright and stuff. That really, uh, in my opinion, undermines liminal, the liminal nature of creativity or stay in the way of its evolution. But I'm particularly interested in ethics and the respect for creative traditions that doesn't necessarily organize themselves on the basis of strict notion of authorship and written agreement. So Atunda, if you may know, um, is actually a Yoruba word that actually signifies reproduce, remake, or, or recreate, you know, Atunda. Because uh, da is, 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 is create, you know, then Atunda is to recreate. But, you know, a process by which organisms reproduce themselves. In a general sense, reproduction means making a copy or a likeness, you know, the ability to replicate and multiply. 
and thereby providing um, uh, for the continuation of existence. You know, in, in African traditions, dance evolved within a complex communal setting that has implicit rules of engagement. That is through time and mutation, borrowing, collage, remixes, new forms evolve within, so it, new forms evolve with its own context. You know, uh, but also we don't contact meaning that something already existing on ground before something else arrives. And when that thing arrives, it's not a kind of a erasure of what was there. They kind of like, yeah, the, the reason why you also speak to them is because the world is already happening on ground. So they kind of like merge it with it. So that's why I use the word either it's through borrowing or through natural mutation or through remix or through collage, <laughs> new forms evolving or with its own particular content. But ultimately, considered as growth and a continuation of creative existence you know, within the community. So when a dance moves or a dance style emerges within a specific African community through the act of transmission or virality, it reaches the next community, would then add this, as I said, uh, uh, to, to an existing local context or repertoire. And by so doing, involves a variant of the previous dance moves, which can now be considered original in its own right. But of all, but all of this, you know, is usually done with a kind of a unspoken <laughs> but strictly respected terms and conditions that make reference to that. And as a means, as, as a matter of fact, you know, dance also partake in the oral transmission of history, of body memory, and contemporary knowledge. Because just like music, dance renders uh, visible the multiple juxtaposition that shapes daily life in Africa. And in the process, it becomes a code for, for social participation, signifying an experience that is constantly on the move. This flow of creative energy accounts for the instability of reality and the dependence of reality itself on the images, the sounds, smells, sights, melodies, slogans, social codes, and dances that domesticate. So when this form of communal creative practice enters the digital sphere, we suddenly realize that we are faced with a peculiar problem. Because our world today is infinitely more complex than, than it used to be. Therefore, much more difficult to control or to follow the, 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 the evolution of things or the acceleration of things. We no longer live in a village where we all know one another. Where it is expected that every participant in the community understands and respects the common rules. You know, now we now live in the whole world where community and globalization are two extremes that maintain each other. Social media platform tells us the idea that everything is found and everything is available for grabs. Uh, we all love the idea of global community as long as it's about personal freedom and our privileged right to violate and consume the other. Well, we come up with, we come up against this, the limit of that freedom when it's about the concept of responsibility. So uh, freedom must therefore globalized, but responsibility and accountability have not. The individual has become a brand with endless need to create objects of attention and self-importance, you know, the likes, you know, the comments, you know, the followers, and going viral, we like them all. They are the incentive for a good job, you know, or an encouragement for, for creating even more engagement online. We cannot but think from our own perspectives alone, but in communal settings, the individual is not an island, you know, it can only exist as part of it. The content curation model of our social media interactions, however, has put the individual on the pedestal uh, and creating a common creative practice has only become harder. Our identity, that is who we are and how we present ourselves to the world, is 99% digitally framed through our social media persona. It is therefore paramount that everyone has the data they generate in the digital universe under their own control. Because our social, our current social currency and relational economy save us feelings and appropriation over fair use, collaboration, and equal sharing. So this is the repercussion of the fallacy of modernity. Individualism took us away from the big system, like religion, political ideologies, culture, or community. 
no one is really invested in them anymore, uh, but we are desperate to give meaning to our social, creative, intellectual, and professional lives. But how do we do that as individuals? It's almost impossible. Because we must derive that from something bigger than ourselves, and that's culture, you know, that's community. The labor connected to the work of community engagement, the labor connected to, to the work of cultural participation gives us language and meaningful systems. And because we no longer exist within such settings, and also because the internet has created a window through which we have a we have an accelerated access to those communities and to those cultures. So we just steal them, we just steal from them as we, you know, the temperament of African knowledge production, however, demands us to slow down, to seek the things for an indefinite period of time for revelation to occur, to feel and to sweat with process, to solidify our connection to the soil or the sounds of nature. The data is deliberately concealed and unbordered about revelation. Our connection to time is embodied and experienced. Transmissions occur through what we call the African sensorium, that is the sound, the smell, the taste, sight, and the ways of adorning the body or other surfaces for visual aesthetic learning through fashion, colors, textiles, such clarification, painting, piercing, masks, headgears, hairdos. You know, the, re the relics of these cultural practices aren't their real expressions, but merely their material representation which are now being misappropriated outside of their own context in, a global, in the global marketplaces, as well as in the cultural institutions. The global pandemic work time, we are now experiencing, you know, just a year after, has forced us to slow down a bit, it seems. But now we can thoroughly reflect and learn about the actual state of our world and its possible future and the planetary repercussion of our actions and our decisions. So new beginning ask us to forget and re-examine as some senses diminishes, other, others will intensify. And to that end, it is necessary to interrogate fair use as we know it. For it is possible that it has become a commodity in itself, an evidence of access and privilege. Africa has been and still continues to be the wild, wide west, where everything can be stolen at will from the original theft of black bodies through slavery and the continued theft of things that they owned or created through colonization and apartheid and now new technology. For the continent with 30% of the world's natural and human resources, the extraction never, never stops with them and it's mostly done with utmost impunity. But in this 21st century, where we all are tweeting and, and Instagramming on top of one another, with our technological luxury. We want to collaborate. We want to collaborate across borders as well. There are lots of African content creators who want to take advantage of the internet and share freely within a data common system, you know, that, 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 that protects their IP from appropriation. But the ethics of intellectual property, as we have noticed, has been broken by the internet of virality. So since technology is in nature and the law isn't helpful, AI is biased and protocols aren't inclusive. It is up to us to encode the kind of future we want, how to structure power and the financial model, how to review and rehabilitate the internet as a creative commons, as a, as a more ethical, democratic, trustworthy, collaborative and open space for exchange and creative innovation. With Atunda, we thought, what if there is an internet of things or let's call it an internet of that, based on a truly shared economy, a globally distributed ledger which uses AI computer vision to learn and identify dance moves and use blockchain technology to keep time stamp records and get these things, these assets that people create back under their own control. Concretely speaking, Atunda is building a technology to house the big data of dance in the metaverse, a digital repository where dance moves are captured memorialized in tangible form and governed through smart contracts. Atunda will have it and analyze a massive amount of dance moves to, pro to produce intelligence. We are double-crossing the law 
by turning that into data, data into code, code into IP, and IP as currency. Because when we highlight creativity and sharing as a core value system, we begin to form economies of ideas network and consider the next stage of our creative economy beyond production, upon continuous production, touring, production, touring, you know, all services, rendering services, or even the technological privilege that we use to, you know, that we, that many artists are also get, getting so much involved in. But to see creativity itself as currency, you know, no matter where it is coming from. In this research, we propose to use artificial intelligence as evidence to fully automate trans annotation process by training different machine learning algorithms through supervised learning on existing human motion data sets. The trained model would then be tested in annotating existing videos on Instagram, on YouTube, on TikTok, and Facebook, and get them validated online through an open source system that associates the global dance community itself. In the field of full body dance movement recognition, Deep learning for artificial intelligence is incredibly data hungry at the moment. And to train deep learning for dance analysis, we need lots of accurately manually labeled sets of dance data across millions of categories. The real world, as we know, don't come with labels or archives, but AI needs accurate reasoning to learn. The data we need for dance movement recognition is almost non-existent in usable data types. So we therefore need to first train AI with fluid intelligence. That is one that has the um, capacity to reason and solve novel problems independent of knowledge or even logic. I theorize therefore that the properties embedded within African dances can teach AI to learn how to learn. Through improved uh, supervision, meta learning in motion recognition, in groove and rhythmic patterns, in our body geometry and forms of improvisation, through a neuro guided technique, we may arrive at fluid intelligence for AI. We can teach AI to learn faster, to learn dance faster and better by learning from experience and borrowing from ideas from cognition sciences. Um, to effectively process, you know, store information and identify semantic differences, for example, uh, between a moonwalk done by Michael Jackson as against the moonwalk done by Barack Obama, for example. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so let's simply imagine Shazam for that. In much way that Shazam led to the first, you know, to, 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 to first being able to recognize music by listening, you know, music that was being played, that was, that, that, that was playing in an environment, and then similar software became the became 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 used for for recognition for recognizing misused copyrighted material. The concepts and protocols we are developing through this research could have parallel impact on the use of that. The database and all the underlying software could be used to recognize unauthorized use in. Uh, uh, I think that again. The database and the underlying software could be used to recognize and authorize use and publication of dance moves in social media applications, such as the same ones again, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and who knows what's coming up. Dancers and choreographers who up to this innovation have had a difficult time monetizing and all protecting their content creation would now have probably uh, have a technology uh, tool to, to be able to aid them to do that. This will go a long way in creating new economic opportunities for dancers. And in essence, it will lay a background for continuous interactive systems to synthesize, preserve, remotely teach, freely share, collaborate, and revolutionize dance and movement in the digital age. Furthermore, Atunda will revolutionize uh, kinesthetic learning and transmission in the age of AI and blockchain. In summary, we will work to make Atunda an ethical, secure, centralized, and automated mobile app. Of course, we're going to need the support of the dance community. It will be an open source system that allows users to share freely and others to use freely while AI and blockchain sit directly. This will be a solution built on neutral, open access infrastructure controlled by no one person. 
a solution where currency, incentives, royalties, and trust are built in. A platform where users can own their data and their app can spy, manipulate, or sell their data for ads. A platform where a community of creatives can verify and auto regulate the flow of content, of knowledge, and their various historiographies. In conclusion, this research has far reaching implications for intellectual property laws, the creative economy, motion related ailments, and addressing racial economic uh, inequality. This, in our estimation, is equally going to move on from the Eurocentric notion of Laban dance notation to a much more universal language for dance coding codification using motion capture technology to record not just the form, but can equally give an account of the unit of groove within a dance move. And of course, this would be of great importance to all the world cultures that have been left in the margins of the history of dance, which is currently very Western, despite the fact that the contemporary global economy was born on the back of slave trade and coloniality, and continue to steal, appropriate, commodify, and profit from the cultural products of Black, Afro Latinx, and Indigenous peoples, often under the guise of globalization, inclusion, and multiculturalism. Atunda is deliberately drawing on the Afro Indigenous, African knowledges and cultural practices to strengthen the technical infrastructure of our community to fully participate in the digital revolution in our own terms and to intentionally return the value of cultural production and labor back into the hands of creators and their communities. Thank you very much. That should be the end of my presentation. Thanks, Kudus. Okay, uh, we are open for questions or comments from the room. So I'm looking for the first raised hand. Can I raise a hand by speaking? <laughs> you certainly can, Joan, and your hands up. Your hand is up. Yes, go ahead. Yay, good, thank you. And um, I don't know, I've just, I replaced a new Zoom program today and I'm not getting my camera working well, but either way, you recognize the voice, Kudus. Thank you so much, such a, a beautiful presentation. It means, um, you know, you really take us to a whole new level um, in terms of our discussions. I have to say that, and it's so uh, meaningful that this is the third of the series um, that we began, of course, with uh, Fumia de Wolle and then to Faustin, and then for you to really begin to ask us to see how we can reverse the thinking of the enormous resources taken from Africa from prior to slavery on through today to this very moment, anywhere we look on the internet. Uh, to reverse that and to really begin to empower um, a process such as your own with Atunda. So my, my uh, one observation that of course it's immediately anti-disciplinary, which is so exciting, which essentially all arts can and should be in the 21st century, because that's, that's the opportunity we have. So you create a beautiful pathway to um, an anti-disciplinary way of thinking which then expands us. But I wanted to ask you, um, and of course the effort that you are um, describing seems like it takes somebody at the center to be completely indefatigable. And of course that's you. Uh, you there's endless energy and the tremendous support of uh, Haji and your team, of course, all together. It's a wonderful collaboration. But my question is, who are other content creators, um, thinkers? Perhaps it's 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 coming from you know various fields. Again, we're thinking an anti-disciplinary term. Maybe they are artists. Maybe they are not. Who are your um, intellectual or um, aspirational colleagues in this moment? Who is out there speaking about what? you are speaking about who is giving both support and ways of thinking about creation of content in such a way that really you know reverses this trend that people that have inspired you let's say perhaps 
Oh, thank you very much for, for that. Um, I, I think, um, I mean, thankfully you've used the term antidisciplinary, which is precisely <laughs> what we, what I, what I, that, which is precisely what I think creativity is about. Um, and especially when you are coming from a, um, from a you know, culture that has enormous amount of um, um, antecedents, you know, especially in music, you know, looking at people like Salah Kuti, uh, Walesha Inka, Chinna Achebe, you know, uh, you, you're coming from a, from so much, you know, there's a lot to take from. But life in itself, especially on the continent, is, is naturally um, problem-based more than domain-based or discipline-based or department-based. You know, we want to solve this problem. We don't look at the, look at the masquerade as, as, a, as a typical example. You know, the masquerade is, um, is, is ought to be a kind of a cyborg, right? A kind of a entity that shares the space between the space of the living and that of the ancestors. And naturally, its language is kind of cryptic because it's speaking to two spaces at the same time. So I've always been fascinated about how and why. Why is the masquerade so interested in, in uniting all the art forms together? Like the, the mask guy itself is a visual artist, the costumier is making the costume of the masquerade. The masquerader itself is a dancer and sometimes a very good singer. Um, there's musicians around, you know, there is an urban scenographer that designed the space. There is, um, there is a whole lot of literature that the masquerade needs to know about, you know, in a way to be able to actually have, depending on what it is, if it's a Galadier masquerade, for example, that is a social masquerade. He also needs to gather information from people in the, in the community to be able to do a proper show. So in that sense, the masquerade cannot just sit down in his house and say, I'm just waiting for the, for the festival. No, there is a whole lot of research and collaboration that is happening. Naturally, younger people, especially uh, when I say younger people, I'm talking about millennials and Gen Z, specifically Gen Z. They are coming from a space where they are center or their space, the main space is the digital space. That is to say with their mobile phone, they know that they record themselves dancing now, put it in the digital universe and somebody in Russia is taking it up immediately and putting it on their own body. So they can see the immediacy of the effect of their creative exploration. And they are automatically using that as a way of developing new ways of being, which means that for you to be able to do that, you must know something about this camera. You must know something about editing. You must know something about, oh yeah, there's a better camera than these are just coming out now. You must know something about your coloring, about choosing the, the location, about the space you want to do. This is not just dance anymore. The younger dancers that are coming from the continent now, automatically, they are multi-talented, they are anti-disciplinary. So for me, it, it only becomes natural that when one begins to think, you know already that the future is, um, is inevitably collaborative. You know, the, you cannot just sit down in your own space and think, because the thing that you think you know, especially I'm, I'm talking to dancers mostly now, uh, there are other domains that are just looking for that. You know, that's why I say, it was actually when I left France that I realized that I don't just want to treat dance anymore just as a, just as an art form or, or artwork. No, I, I was looking at my entire life as the art in itself. So whether I am on stage, whether I'm in community working with kids, whether I'm online, whether I, wherever I am, the, the work continues. So whether it's um, in form of a dance show or in form of a mobile app, I'm still bringing the same logic of, um, of uh, composition, of, of choreography, you know, to all of these things. And there are people who are looking for that intersection. AI, like I said, is at the moment, currently data hungry, needs dancers to come in and collaborate with it. And so that because I believe, I believe really that usually when we talk about technology in the dance space, we are always saying, oh, how can technology help us? How can technology help us to go further? I'm like, no, it's the other way around. 
The human body is a most sophisticated technology, and this is what we already mastered. So whatever technology that is coming now should come and learn from us and then use what we already know as a way to push technology itself further. And this is the way I'm actually coming into the space of AI and all these things to say, this is what I know about dance. These are the problems that we're trying to solve. If you are capable of solving this problem for us, automatically your technology becomes more intelligent. Yes, brilliant, thank you. Yeah, I see a hand raised from Brenda Chalfin. Go ahead, Brenda. So this is really provocative. Uh, at the same time, it's so hard for me to wrap my head around it because crypto just seems um, so incredibly complicated in terms of the blockchain technology. And for those of us who don't have that expertise, um, just to understand the steps required. I mean, you were very helpful in terms of dance, data, code, IP, um, and then some kind of currency. So if you could perhaps kind of reiterate those steps for like a super novice um, who has a barely an understanding of what this is. But my other question has to do with um, issues of not just of value, but of profit. And is this kind of working within a capitalist system? Is this standing outside? Is this harnessing it? Um, uh, does this compare in any way with, you know, the way artworks are now um, presented as these non-fungible tokens? So there's kind of a uniqueness to them that's preserved. Um, what about dance and its whole, um, kind of the, the spirit of circulation that's so essential to it. Um, would this underline circulation? That dan dance, it, it's a language, it's, it's a practice, it, it moves. And would this kind of upset that mobility? How would it impact that? So just a series of, of questions for you. Hmm. Um, interesting. So uh, the, first, the first thing to say about blockchain, you see, each time when I mention blockchain, I always talk about blockchain technology. And I never, there was no moment I talked about, there, actually there was no moment I talked about cryptocurrency. So people always kind of like equate the two together. In my opinion, I feel like cryptocurrency was built upon the blockchain technology. And in the same way, NFT is also being built on the blockchain technology. You see the difference already. NFT is, is just JPEGs and photos, you know, artwork, but cryptocurrency is actually currency in itself that is being placed on it. So blockchain for me is more, is more about the, like I said, blockchain will help us to create a kind of a time stamp to say, this person was the one that put this thing on this thing first and it is, you know, it locked on it. But one thing that I have a problem with myself, you know, in, in that is that what if, just like I also mentioned, what if Michael Jackson comes and say, I invented moonwalk, so I made my moonwalk on the blockchain and it is immutable, nobody can change that. Then somebody comes to and say, no, no, that you didn't create it. This person created it. How do we change that? So there is something called GitHub, you know, where uh, people are, are beginning to use uh, technology. Like imagine, imagine it like a kind of a, like a kind of a Wikipedia that allows you to to mean something and say, you know, we were the ones that created this. But like like you see in my last um, um, when I was making the summary, I was also hoping that the dance community itself will be able to come up and participate in that process of annotation, in that process of, of looking at, you know, of, of, of saying, how can, we, um, how can we also participate and say, you know what, uh, we can also reevaluate, we can also edit. That's what I'm trying to say. We can, we, as a collective, we can participate in the, in the proper, 
uh, annotation and the proper hashing or hashtag for those things. And the AI system is learning based on the amount of conversation that's also going on, especially when it's, when it's being properly hashtag. So for me, I am gonna try to say that precisely is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about cryptocurrency. I'm talking about blockchain technology itself, which of course, eventually, uh, it comes to also uh, make allusion to, okay, if you are changing it from, from currency to assets, then maybe that's what NFT is about. Yeah, NFT is something that I'm excited about as well, that I've been looking at a lot. And um, I don't know so much about it at the moment, especially when it comes to the fact that currently NFT is, is mainly about, about you know, JPEGs and you know, photos and, and digital art. But to bring that as, a, as, as something that is ephemeral, that is emotion, that is everything you said, onto that space, what proper uh, problematic will it bring and how do we solve it? I am not one of those who are uh, naturally um, disturbed about provocations or things that are that are disturbing, and I think they should be because that's the only way at which we can ask the the right questions. And when we ask the right questions, we have the capacity already of 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 moving an inch of moving humanity a bit forward. And that for me is my interest. Because the problematic that I'm really focusing on is very different from, from, from that of the problem of dance itself. You know, that's, that's another domain. The one we are talking about now is the question of dance as IT. How can all the, all the, all the generations and generations of people whose aesthetic, whose work, whose labor, you know, when you see the amount of labor that people are doing in Lagos to invent these things every day. And they are dead. They are dead dying. They're dead dying of hunger. And however, on the other side of the Atlantic, somebody is being get, is getting a hundred million dollars of, 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 of deal and just extracting, just taking without any, any form of impunity, without any form of like, you know, what do we do about that? So for me, I think as a community, as a community of human beings, uh, we should be asking very, very vital questions about that. And it was my asking those questions that also led me to, you know, to coming up with all of these uh, research um, proposition and answers. But of course, we're still in the moment, we're still in the process of it. We are not at the end of it yet. So everything is still being listened. We are listening, we are learning, and we are hearing. And hopefully, uh, at the, before we eventually release the, the project itself, we would have learned from different kinds of conversations. Like Thanks for that clarification. Okay, the next question or comment is from Funmi. Welcome back. Hi, thank you very Hi. much. Um, Kudus, thanks for that um, really thought-provoking, exciting uh, provocation. Um, I don't know whether this is a comment or a question, really. Um, but when you were speaking about this, it made me um, think think back to modern dance in America. And um, I mean, there there must be dance historians in the room that can correct me if I'm wrong, because it's not my this is not my area of speciality. But when modern dance, you know, uh, took off with people like Martha Graham in the foreground, they consider themselves to be dancers, not choreographers. And I think one of the reasons why the idea of being a choreographer emerged was around the issue of ownership. Who owns the dance work? And, you know, at, at, at the time, we found a, situ a situation where musicians were doing much better because there was the composer who could say, yes, I created uh, the composition. And so economically, the composers did did better. Um, and one of the shift to develop the idea of the choreographer was the idea of who owns things. Yeah. And there were even yeah. battles um, between, uh, I think there was one between a American choreographer and an Indian dancer. I think the Indian dance, I think this um, this was, 
probably 30s or 40s. I'm, I'm not sure. I can't remember properly. But the Indian dancer took the American choreographer to court for using his dance work without, you know, payment. And the Indian dancer was also a cook. So in the end, the court case, the American choreographer won because the Indian dancer's job role was cook, even though he was a dancer. We know that being a cook, being a, you can be a cook and a dancer quite easily. And so the ideas of professionalization, of saying who does what, and who was around the idea of how do you get paid and who owns the work. So that is one of the problems of modernity because once you start setting up institutions and professions around something, this issue of ownership comes. And then the idea of what is copyright free is also uh, uh, an issue. So I me, mean, I tell folk tales, it's one of the things I do. And they're all copyright free because they're all over, you know, 50 years old or 500 years old, who owns them in a way, you know? And so this idea that and, you know, it's happened a lot within black cultures where people from the global north will extract things from um, a black culture because no one owns it in a sense. And in the modern and bringing it into the modern being an institutional arrangement. And that's the way I'm looking at modernity here. You bring it into the modern where it's packaged, where it's copyrighted, where it becomes part of a professional and institutional system that is considered to be the place where you can control and you can you can put price to and value to everything else is up for grabs. The social dance is up for grabs because who owns it? It's a community. It's, com it's copyright free. It's been handed down for generations. And I see that the provocation you're putting forward will cause us to ask these questions again. Because once we say we're tracing the data of dance in terms of Africa and we're saying you should pay for this or there should be some kind of exchange, we come up to asking ourselves how are we organizing or reimagining how we org um, our society in, in, in terms of institutions. And now Africa has a very significant, um, um, we're quite unique in that we have institutions that are generations old, as well as the more recent modern institutions. So we have the King's Palace and a democracy, or we have a university and still the cultural settings and where people learn culturally. We have them overlapping in, in Nigeria today and in Lagos and in, in our villages. And how do we work with this in that arrangement? When someone says, oh, Johnny um, devised this form, I am sure someone will say, ah, but there's an older form that existed before that, which Johnny brought, you know, um, took, took, um, I remember when I used to laugh, I used to like to dance to the work of the musician, Daddy, um, oh, there was one musician, um, Daddy, one of his nicknames is Daddy, I forget the rest of it. And someone said, ah, that dance he's dancing, it's my traditional dance from the village, he has reworked it for his band in Lagos, you know, that kind of thing. So who owns who owns dance? I'm not saying, I'm just trying to say that your provocation will cause us to start thinking about that, those things. And that is something that we have neglected a lot in Africa in terms of the history of our more recent institutions, the ones we've, ad we've adopted and adapted from Western culture. What is the history of Nigerian television? What is the history of the Nigerian university? Who are the figures in there? What's the thinking that has gone into creating the university in Africa today? Or even the music industry, those histories are there. Are they written? What decisions have we made so far in those places to which you're coming now and you're coming, you know, left field and making a proposition that makes everybody sit up and say, which context are we going to, how are we going to handle this contextually, you know, in, in a social cultural context? So that's one thing I said. I also want to address the issue of disciplinary and antidisciplinary. I like the idea of antidisciplinary. However, I don't think we're at a point where we can put the disciplinary away. The reason is, is it still a language by which we have to think and argue because so much of what we do are around it. 
you yourself, your choreographer, who's no longer limiting themselves to the idea of choreo um, of uh, um, limiting themselves to the idea of choreography. You're looking at life in general. However, the concepts you have engaged with it in choreography are the things that you're challenging now. And so your knowledge of the discipline is something you can use to transcend the discipline. And I think right now we have not engaged with sociology of our institutions in Africa, and we need to do so, even if it's to do so to break down those silos. Um, yeah, so that was, I, 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 I mean, any responses to that? There's not really a question, but, you know, I just threw some things out there that you might want to, you know, pick out of and, 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 and respond to. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much, sister. Um, uh, this is this is very interesting. Everything you said is super interesting. Interesting. Uh, I I feel like um, in in the first one, um, you know, you are you're you're talking about. Let me remember if I get distracted. Um, you're talking about yeah 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 yeah. You see, for me, for me, it's um, like I said. I think I'm one person who I feel so much the burden, uh, you know, the responsibility of, of of our people, you know. But at the same time, I my kind of person is not one who is um, so much interested or or bothered about problems. I think problems are fine. I love them actually. I think I was a scientist before I became an artist, so solving problems, solving mathematical problems was what we used to say then. So and we always get excited just solving mathematical problems. <laughs> so so for me, I I I feel like I I'm, I just got tired and fed up of the amount of 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 complaints, you know, that we, we always make. And I just thought uh with the arrival of all of these technological advancements, and I was just like, how can we hijack these technologies and bring them in the middle of, of, of disruption? Because there are a lot of disruption happening at the moment. And if we don't quickly jump into it, we will also be left out as always. So I'm interested in why, because everything you're saying about, you know, it will do this, it will do that. I'm, I'm for it, actually. And I think that that's what I want. I want the conversation to start. But now it needs to start knowing fully well that there is, a, there, is a, there is already a motion. That is to say, we are having that conversation in motion. We are learning on our feet and we are, we are, we are changing things, we are editing things, which is more or less the way I think we build the student center, the people center in Lagos, for example. We, we learned, we learned about what it can be by doing. We didn't sit down somewhere write uh, the the application or whatever or this is what we're trying to do now we're like we go we do it then the problem that it will bring will come then maybe 20 years or even maybe less than maybe five years from now some kids will come from angola or from johannesburg to disrupt it again say no this that thing is rubbish let's throw it out of the window uh, because we have a better tool now for me this is what i want this is what i'm expecting and i'm excited i'm always excited when i see when I see uh, people coming up to have an actual conversation, and that is to say, conversation that is not centralizing whiteness, that is not centralizing Europeans or people of the North or whatever you want to call it, but I centralizing us. And we are asking questions about our own um, reality and how to move our own reality forward and how to move ourselves to, to the promised land. Because when are we going to fulfill the book? You know, now there's AI technology, now there's blockchain technology. When are we going to fulfill the book? What are we waiting for? <laughs> waiting for good odds? So for me, I'm, I'm interested in, let's just start. This is where I can come in. I know that this is what I can do. I'm expecting that when it comes out and people are also kind of like, you know, engaging, you know, and we're going to make sure that we build it in a way that it's not, Definitive. That is to say, we can still go back to alter things and change things, and and you know, like I said, we 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 learn on our feet. Uh, that for me is one thing I think I would say about that first aspect of things. 
The second one was, um, I can't even remember, uh, was more. <laughs> It was a bit was about the again? disciplinary and anti-disciplinary. Oh, I mean, again, that as well is also a provocation. Of course, I mean, we're coming from discipline. You know, somebody, you know, I always tell people that there's a difference between profanity and blasphemy. You know, I love blasphemy more than profanity. And you can only be blasphemous if you already believe in the existence of a God. If you don't, you don't even, blasphemy does not even exist because you don't even give it any existence. So for me, it is the belief in the discipline and then pushing the boundaries of the discipline, or, or let me even say breaking the boundaries of the discipline to be able to go. Because usually most of us, you know, all these things that I know now about technology, I have to, I have to leave. I have to physically move into other people's domain. And when you move into another domain, of course, you're going to start from one. You're not going to jump in from 100, but many people want to stay within the comfort of their own discipline, and they are not really making the move to, to know, to understand what are people doing in medicine, what are people doing in science, what are people doing in geography, what are people doing in photography, what are people doing in, 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 in poetry, visual art. I've always been excited about that, and I think I started first, all my work that I've made, I've always been collaborative with a light designer, with a video artist, with a musician. And I started pushing the boundaries of that even further and further and further. And who knows, maybe I'll, I'll join, I'll go into NASA next and say, what's dance in space? <laughs> I don't know, I, but, but it's still the boundary of the discipline that you're pushing forward. But I, I think it's an amazing, an amazingly uh, courageous strategy and the right one, because as you say, in, in you know, the young artists on the, in, in Lagos, they, they're not sitting down to, to study disciplines before they make. And, uh, and I think uh, the way you're pushing the discussion, I think it forces others to sit up and, 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 and um, take the discussion forward because there's certain problems I think we need to get rid of and get another problem, you know? Okay. And I would rather deal with this problem. <laughs> <laughs> because it's actually pushing the pushing the thinking forward and sometimes i think in 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 the continent of africa and i say the continent across because you know uh, i i i engage people with many networks we feel we need to deal with the problem that happened back then and i feel right now deal with the problem in front of us and then in doing that, we'll deal with some yeah, of the problems the from back. Already, we start rewriting and start reworking. And so nothing I said was to say, no, I don't think this is the way to go. It's more to say, these are the these are the conversations that will start coming up alongside what you're doing, not to stop it, but to be part of that thing. And I think it will it it will raise raise the level of discourse in a variety of areas. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you both. We have another question or comment from Anani. Anani, go ahead. Yeah, um, uh, just gonna put a bit my light here. <laughs> the man in black. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, how are you, bro? Ça va? How you doing, man? On gère, on gère petit à petit. <laughs> hey, wow. Yeah, hey, my name is Anani Doji Kosi Sanuvi. And uh, thank you again, John. Thank you, Kudus. Uh, it's always a uh, excited moment for me to come and listen and participate the way we can, you know. You know. The, always a, a pleasure to, to listen to the brothers and sisters in these matters. Um, Kudus, one thing I would really would love if it's possible, you, have, you can explain a little bit for me, uh, for my curiosity. And, and, Maybe you already did, but I'm really curious if you take an opportunity, if you can explain how the views related to the cryptocurrency, how this thing works. If it's possible, it's okay. If it's not possible, we can talk later. 
how the views become money. The view, you know. Oh, the views, the number of views. You mean. Yeah, the number of views becomes money on this uh, uh, market, digital market, because it's uh, extremely interesting. And the second question is, um, we know that the the ocular view, huh, the la, la vision oculaire du mouvement est différent de la caméra. The ocular view is totally different than the camera. How the camera sees the movement and how it captures the movement, and the or the sensor inside the camera also how does it uh, uh, manipulate the data that comes in. We have a brain, of course, but the, you know the camera also have a kind of a brain. Today, cameras have AI or they have their own way of processing the movement. Sometimes the movement even becomes slower or faster inside the, inside the, 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 the data. So my question inside this relationship, relationship between the ocular view and the camera and the, the movement that's going to be in front of the both, for example. Uh, when you see a, a movement live, it has a certain quality, it has a certain uh, energy, it has a certain thing, you know, the wave being. But then we have ethically, uh, some of us have ethically for many years been related in a circular way with certain ethics with the non-human entities during the performance or during the dance. Those non-human uh, entities are not visible for the camera. Uh, they see physical shape and physical human. This is what the camera sees. But when I see, for example, I'm going to go like I see uh, visually uh, um, Kudus moving, some of us can see beyond the physicality. We can see there is more than you. I'm sure you know what, what, what I mean. We can see that there is other things around uh, uh, um, uh, Kudus who's moving as well with him, meaning saying you are not alone. You are not alone. We were never alone. We have our entities with us. But how is this relationship uh, with these issues or these um, these matters when it comes to to maybe train? I'm I'm I, I, I I'm thinking like maybe you guys are training for a certain way of filming the movement, filming the gesture from which angle the camera is going to be. Are you going to be? Up, down, or, uh, or how is how is it the making of the filming? They have their own intelligence. The the young one, we can see videos like, oh my God, they're really really advanced how to film what they do, you know. But do you in Lagos or in the studio, you, you do you think about a way of processing the movement? Do you think about the ethical path towards our ancestors spiritually? Do you think of all those also trying to in, engage a conversation about this. I don't know if I'm a bit clear. It's just now that I, I thought about it. So if you can talk about it, this, 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 is, this is very interesting. Um, you know, no, no, the number one thing is that I'm not, again, I think I always like to tell people that I'm not inventing anything. No, no, no. I, I, <laughs> I, I um, only either studying African yeah. and African diasporic uh, cultural practices, mm -hmm. the use of technology, and the way that which they've already always uh, participated in inventing technologies to solve particular problems. Mm -hmm. And I am also looking at our own either spiritual or or um, animate practices that in itself has already some level of technology embedded within them. So mm. if, if we agree that, you know, uh, reincarnation, for example, if, if we take reincarnation as a, as a day and understand that time and space within our own context, context is, is, not, is not linear, you know, mm -hmm. it's cyclical, there is a direct present in the now relationship mm -hmm. between us here right now 
our ancestors and the unborn spirit, if we know that we all exist in this current moment. I'm interested in technology from the ways that each all of these non, um, non-physical elements that is being transmitted, how they've been transmitted uh, yeah, yeah. Within, within the African understanding of that. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. currently, how the younger people, you know, <laughs> how they have understood that, even without any form of schooling, you know, they didn't have any knowledge about those things. And they're mm-hmm. using almost the same form of transmission between I never believed that people could record themselves. (laughs) And somebody else can be watching it. And in the matter of a day or two, we send you back the video. Like this was the highest level of sophistication when we were learning dance. Like, oh my God, (laughs) I'm gonna learn the video for the choreography or it's gonna be so hard. But this is the entry point for every young person now. They actually start learning dance from YouTube they, they learn movement on Instagram and they're reproducing it. This is a new ability. We should be very clear about that. Neither your generation, as young as we are, or the generation of, I don't know, John Frosch, w- mm. would have done that easily. And they would have said, just everything you're saying, no, dance needs transmission. It needs to be physical. We need to be here together to learn how to dance. I'm like, are we studying the future a bit? Are we really just like looking and see where this trend is going? If you can see where it's going, you can already realize that new ways and new, um, what's the word? New abilities are gonna be built based on the technology that is available for us. So I'm not coming from the point of view of my own knowledge of dance as it was some 20 years ago or 10 years ago. I am mm-hmm. trying to start from where we are at the moment. So I'm not even making a case that we're gonna film it in a special way. No, that's why whatever technology that we are building, if it cannot be done through the mobile phone, which is where the Gen Z are at the moment, I'm not, we haven't done anything. We we must be the same video, the same way they are filming it. I'm not inventing any new way of filming dance. The same way they've been filming it with their mobile phone is where we must be thinking from. We cannot, think of uh, some sensors, some way of filming in a yeah. different way. Mm-hmm. And, and like I said to, to Brenda as well, I'm not in any way uh, uh, going into some other conversation about that. I'm talking about just this whole idea of this phenomenon that is already in motion. And we're already seeing it generating substantial amounts of money that mm-hmm. is being swept away from the original owners of the thing. I'm only yeah. coming as a way to a response to that and say, wait a minute, this is the only ethic I'm personally thinking about at the moment. All the other questions I expect that they're gonna come. And when they come, I also expect that we have um, enough people around that can answer those questions because it's not all the questions I can answer personally. You know what I'm saying? So for me, I'm looking at, let's just say, you know, for example, you and I, Maybe we saw it, we met each other, we met each other in 2006 in Paris. And maybe we saw each other once or twice in Amsterdam where we were there. But between that time and now, this is over 10 years already passed. Yeah. And yet you can say, oh, I know could this is what. <laughs> but you only knew it digitally. You haven't yeah. even been in the same space as me to talk about that work, to see that work. But we can still make a summation, we can still make an understanding. You know what I'm saying? So the same way we can think about music. Of course, if you listen to your music on your earpod, it's not really at the same like being there in the concert or being in the studio with the musicians mm-hmm. and in the intimacy of it. But there yeah. are different layers and different layers of experiences. And I'm just saying that dance is at the very, 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 very ancient time when it comes to what music has done where music has taken the conversation. So we are, are really, that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in how can we level up. Yeah, you're not right. I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, maybe you didn't hear me up, but um, in, during the pandemic moment, I, if you see behind, it's black. 
That's the dense floor for me today. It's you come vertical, right? This dense floor come with the with the with the there is a webcam in front of me, you know. I see the difference. That's the where, where the research start. I see a huge difference between what we do, where we come from. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. We have so a lot of micro, micro, nano movement that is difficult yeah. for the, the audience to see where they are like in the 300 meters or 400 meters from the real performer. So I realized that technology, the, the technology now, the, the, the technology today make, uh, make actually much more visible some micro movement. I couldn't make people see if in a theater like uh, 500 meters, the person is on audience. I, sh I have to have been trained like this, right? You have to do a big movement so that the audience can see you. This classical formation that we get. But today it's like, oh, actually I can reach more people doing nano micro movement. And this is the camera who comes to amplify, amplify this yeah, yeah, way of yeah. moving. You know what I'm saying? This is not yeah. really, this, we don't get it in the, in the formation of a dancer. We, we have it in a different way. But what is beautiful inside this, what is happening, that's, that was one of the reasons I was asking you, there is a research around how the camera would capture, because I've done it, to be honest with you, I've done it, I've done, I spent like, hours on the camera and try to question the camera is like what the hell is this thing how can we how can we see how, what do we do it's new it's today you know what do we do and that's the question for me for you like how when 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 the capture happened when the, the moment to put it for example you have to upload it in google drive right what usually when you upload it in google drive or you upload it in instagram the delay between the sound and the movement usually shift a little bit. So the, 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 process, the, the process from the, data, the, the original database into Instagram, there is already a kind of a losing data, losing the quality of the sound. It's even worse when it's a, 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 um, a percussion. It's even worse. So we lose the quality of the percussion. So we need another media, which is actually a, a, an engineer of sound, have to record the sound separately from the movement and the camera. So we, we in between transmedia relationship, you know, the, which I found very beautiful. And it is, like you say, it's a whole world around this. And this whole world doesn't involve only the performer. It doesn't involve only the camera. There is also a light you know, which is behind all those uh, effects. The, the, don't, don't take me wrong, I'm, I'm actually with you in the sense of uh, things are changing. We are, we are aware of that. And how can we move on with what is today? And that's one of the reasons I'm interested about how the views, how this world of the views become money, you know, how this- yeah, You what also ask, you talked about the views and- um... okay. And, and I, I mean, there is another project we're doing uh, tied to Astropolis, which mm -hmm. is more or less more of a platform than, than just a software. And mm -hmm. uh, during my research for that one, I, I actually think um, the, the, ter the terror of, because for example, look at the, the Netflix model, for example. Netflix mm -hmm. doesn't care if there's one view or 20 view or 2 million view. <laughs> Yeah, no, you know what I mean? Like there's a different economy. Yeah. And I don't really believe in the economy that that mm -hmm. YouTube or Instagram or those people who actually show views. I don't believe mm -hmm. in, in that. I don't think it's um, sustainable. And it's, it's also because their their model is, is adverse based. Mm -hmm. And that's where the whole conversation about data rights becomes another conversation entirely. Because uh there is only there are only two percent of um of of uh, content uh, creators on YouTube, two percent mm -hmm. that are able to make above minimum wage. So those platforms, there is a whole new conversation about that one that I <laughs> that I know that I can get into as well. But they are not the platform that I want to invest my data into now, because mm -hmm. they they are they are um, they are perpetuating also this same uh, logic of where you know there's a whole lot of uh, mm -hmm. money, there's a whole lot of wealth that is being made mm -hmm. 
And who mm. is really rich is the owners of the platform, not yeah, sure. all the millions of billions even of people mm. sharing, putting their content in there every day. They're not making anything from that. So I'm questioning that. Is there a whole new research that I'm making to problematize that in itself and to say, you know what, we need to create a different kind of platform. And that's also where I feel like the whole conversation about, about, about cryptocurrency, especially now coming back to Brenda's question, Atunda itself has nothing to do with that, but there's a whole new space that we are building where we are mm-hmm. actually eventually coming to use uh, cryptocurrency as a way of uh, uh, capturing the, the intangible values that creatives already create. Like when mm-hmm. we make work, Apart from the fact that I'm making and creating a dance piece, there's a whole that's the tangible thing you can see. But there's a whole bunch of other things I'm participating in without even naming them. And I feel mm-hmm. like uh especially after the seven years I've spent in Nigeria, in Nigeria there's no way you can convince leaders or politicians or anybody actually for that matter, your parents, your friends, there's no way you can convince them about what you're doing if you don't talk about your income. So 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 for me. I, I got to talk a lot about the intangible value of what I'm doing beyond uh, what am I adding to the GDP or whatever, but the whole conversation about the whole ecosystem that the fact of me being a choreographer within this society is contributing to this, 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 this. So now the only way, the, 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 way, the way I'm trying to solve that problem is to bring a currency, which again, now talking about cryptocurrency, which in itself is speculative, and to bring it and again drag it into the whole idea of, of, of creativity and say, you know what, I want to own my platform. I don't want YouTube or Instagram or TikTok or whatever to have access to my thing. I'm going to do my practices and I'll create the platform within which I disseminate that practice. Then I will also create the money. <laughs> I will also create the currency through which transactions will be done on my own work. I think the first person that was able to do something, you know, that kind of like opened our eyes to that in a way was Prince. Of course. You know, and many people didn't understand what Prince was doing also because cryptocurrency was not a thing at that time. So Prince Mm -hmm. didn't really put blockchain. Imagine Prince actually put blockchain to itself without going Mm -hmm. crazy, you know. And Mm -hmm. for me, I feel like there's more and more space now for independent artists and content Mm -hmm. creators to start to use their own following and start to think of ways to transform their following into um, into sponsors or supporters or things like that. And to actually do it deliberately, not, I, not waiting for YouTube to put so much advert on my videos and then give me two cents at the end of the year, at the end of the year. So for me, I think there are new models and new, uh, new platforms that people have been thinking about now. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. There is one uh, one more um, one more question, which is actually a problem. Uh, where where it's uh, when I was here, I was developing a project with uh, deaf people, the people who, who who actually people can't talk. You know, the 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 sourds, yeah. 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 um, But in this time of inclusion, in this time of inclusion, in, inside your project, did did you talk about the blind people? Because the blind people will not see what you're doing, and we're in time of inclusion. So I'm just I'm just jumping into oh maybe it's an opportunity inside this also to think about how uh, the narrative and the narrative of the gesture can also reach a blind person. You know what I'm saying? So it becomes it becomes something which is beyond just the ocular view, beyond the camera. So we have something. It's not just for the the people here can see, you know, and we also have something that be, be, beyond and beyond the 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 people who can see. So uh, that's why I started just joining. I started in, in a video in camera work like that. I started to do gesture and movement linked to the rhythm. That can be that could be uh, easily be translated in words if somebody has to trans. Uh, translated to a blind person, for example, because it's a whole world of sensibility there that we don't know. The deaf and the the, the, the sue and the blind people, they also see dance in a different way. They see movement in a different way. So maybe, you know, it's something to think about just, you know. Sure, 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 sure. There's a whole new space for that as well, for sure. So that's it. 
Thank you very much, Anani.